Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the various typhoons that the ship sailed through, and also about sea keeping. How well were the Iowa-class battleships out at it, and what are some things that affect it? This video was specifically requested by a viewer. And again, we, we don't uh, use the names in this video for privacy's sake, but you know who you are. Uh, it costs us roughly $50 to shoot a video. So if you've got an idea that you would like us to see made, let us know. Uh, you can email us, you can drop it in the comments section. Uh, if you don't donate, odds are, if, if you've got a good idea or even a question that, that isn't even related to this, we'll cover it in a future video at some point. We tend to plan our videos about a month out. Uh, so if you make a request, it could be a couple months before you see one air. If you would like us to bump it up in the uh, order of priority, feel free to make that donation. Originally, we were gonna post this video in December at the anniversary of Typhoon Cobra, but uh, we're bumping it up now, and it's a little bit nicer sitting out here on deck than it would be in December. Uh, first, I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Halsey's Typhoons. During World War II, Battleship New Jersey and the rest of Third Fleet under Admiral Halsey sailed through a couple of typhoons. Storm tracking was not as good as it is today. The whole concept of picking up storms on radar was brand new. And in peacetime, you might have had shore stations or ships further out at sea to be able to radio in, hey, we just got hit by a storm heading east to west, so it's probably going to hit you guys out west in X amount of time, it's pretty rough. Maybe you want to stay in port, or maybe if you stay in port, you're going to get damaged. You, you want to sortie out to sea and avoid this storm. World War II, with uh, the Japanese controlling half of the Pacific, the Australia, British, even some French colonies, the Dutch, they, they all had possessions around here. Different people controlling different areas and not wanting to send out radio messages that the enemy can intercept and find your location, uh, these sorts of detection methods were not used. Believe it or not, the Coast Guard started their first ocean weather stations just before the United States entered World War II. During the war, these were discontinued. Uh, so there, there was very primitive weather detection and coordination systems in place. Pacific can be a brutal place. We're all familiar with kamikazes, the Japanese aircraft named after the, the divine wind that uh, were used late in the war. What we're maybe less familiar with as at least Western viewers, is the original kamikaze, the original divine win. The Mongols attempted to invade Japan uh, in the 1200s on two separate occasions. And in both occasions, huge typhoons blew up around Japan and wrecked the Mongol invasion fleet. So the Japanese said that this was an act of God. If it was an act of God, then the various storm kamis were still protecting Japan during World War II. Because in late 1944 and uh, throughout 1945, the typhoon season in the Western Pacific around Japan was really, really rough. Halsey, without proper information, sailed through two separate typhoons, one in December of 1944 and another one in June of 1945. And then, in October of 1945, the biggest typhoon of them all hit the U.S. fleet. Fortunately, by October, because of the atomic bombs, Japan had agreed to surrender, and the United States was already occupying Japan peacefully. Uh, and this meant that a number of ships that would have been operating off the coast of Japan were actually import safe. But the storm hit the island of Okinawa and absolutely trashed it. And that's where the United States was preparing for the invasion of Japan, which would have been held in November, Operation Downfall. So if the U.S. fleet had uh, had to conduct an invasion of Japan, it is possible that a divine wind would have absolutely decimated the fleet. So let's look at these storms. Uh, the first one was called Typhoon Cobra. This is the one in December of uh, 44. There's a link in the description to a video we did about six months ago on this. So uh, that's got some specific details about it. I won't rehash it in too much detail here. But uh, basically, 
Third Fleet was refueling. They had just won the Battle of the Philippine Sea and they were still operating in the area supporting the American invasion efforts there. Third Fleet had made it through that battle virtually unscathed and had made it so that the Japanese fleet would never sortie in mass again. And yet, this storm was able to absolutely trash the American fleet, sink three ships, damage dozens other, and destroy well over 100 aircraft. Uh, Admiral Nimitz himself remarked that it was as if Third Fleet had just gotten back from a major engagement. So, uh, why was this such an issue? These ships are obviously designed to operate in stormy weather. Well, one, Halsey's meteorologists uh, plotted the storm going in the opposite direction. So Halsey made some decisions that he probably would not have if he had an accurate storm plot. Uh, two, because he was operating a major fleet, he tried to keep the fleet in formation throughout the storm. He probably should have ordered them to break up so that every ship could take its best course in the storm. Uh, earlier than he did, and if he had have known the intensity of the storm, I suspect he would have. Halsey was a destroyerman from way back, uh, from the age of the flush deck destroyers, which really rocked and rolled. Uh, so I, I am sure if he had complete information, he would have made better decisions. Uh, and three, Third Fleet had just finished conducting, conducting major operations, so they were in the middle of refueling as the sea state was getting worse during this storm. Some of these ships were trying to refuel off of the Iowa-class battleships, and in those days, the refueling rig was near the bow of the ship, and because the Iowa-class battleships have a narrow bow that comes back and then flares out, that causes bow waves to come out and flare out as well, which makes holding your position as a ship trying to refuel very difficult. It's continuously trying to push you away, so you're trying to navigate back and could slam into the side of a ship. Wouldn't be an issue for the battleship, but for the small tin can destroyer refueling from us, that's extremely hazardous. In the 1980s, they corrected this by adding a refueling boom at the after end of the superstructure, where you've got a long straight run of hull uh, that made it better, but not perfect. So over the course of this storm, several of the ships uh, were damaged and three were lost with a huge loss of life. Obviously getting into a lifeboat in a typhoon is not the best for your health. So uh, what led to the loss of these ships? Top weight, primarily. Basically, during the war, we had been adding more electronics to ships, radars, radios, those sorts of things, as newer and more modern uh, devices were invented. Also, to protect against aircraft, more and more anti-aircraft equipment had been added. The Iowa-class battleships have a huge reserve of buoyancy, and they were able to take these changes pretty well. But even so, if you look at these ships during World War II, you'll see that there's a lot of unused deck space that could have been used for anti-aircraft guns, and they weren't. It's because they couldn't add too much weight. And the higher up in the ship you're adding that weight, the more of a top weight issue it causes, and the more likely it is to make the ship roll. If that's a problem for a 57,000 ton battleship, it's a huge problem for a destroyer designed before the war to be 1,500 tons and fit inside treaty regulations. And these ships were built right up to the treaty regulations. So as they add anti-aircraft guns and radar, you're just adding more and more top weight. Top weight. So some of these early gold plater destroyers, such as the Farragut class ships, were severely overweight even though they removed some of their five inch guns to save weight. And that caused the loss of some of these ships. Others, it was because they didn't have full fuel tanks. Uh, the fuel is a lot of weight deep inside the ship. On Iowa class battleships, we've got a triple bottom. So those two layers of void spaces underneath basically the whole length of the ship are filled with liquids. Uh, boiler feed water, and fuel primarily. And so there is always weight down in the bottom of the ship to counter out, counteract the top weight above. These destroyers that were low on fuel did not have weight there. What you would normally do is fill those fuel tanks with seawater to add the weight back in. But then that contaminates your fuel tanks with seawater. And uh, you can use some of it. The oil will float on the seawater, so the top of it won't be contaminated. 
but especially in high sea states, that liquid is sloshing around, so you might end up with a mixture of fuel and salt water in, in your fuel oil lines, which is gonna blow out your boilers. And in the instance of the ships that were lost, all of them lost power before they were sunk. If you can turn your ship into the storm, you can take those waves bow on, and that's how a ship is designed to take them. The ships have breakwaters at the bow to break those waves and send them over to the sides of the ship where the gunnels are, the channels that are designed to shed that. Uh, however, if a ship is being hit continuously broadside onto the waves, she'll start to roll. And with a couple of the destroyers that were lost, it was due to seawater going down the funnel, getting into the boilers and putting out the fires. That knocks out all of your power. Uh, and then you've got no, uh, no propulsion to make headway. And so the storm just pushes you wherever it wants and you roll over eventually. And, and that's what happened with, with the sh three ships that were lost. New Jersey made it through these storms uh, well to relatively unscathed. In fact, uh, the fact that Halsey was commanding from New Jersey may have uh, prevented him from knowing the full severity of the situation. The storm clouds made it very dark, so he couldn't see his ships, which were operating over dozens of miles of ocean. Uh, so he couldn't necessarily see the destroyers at the outer ring of the picket uh, rolling the heaviest. All he could see were his battleships and carriers taking the waves, and he could certainly feel the waves rocking. It, it's reported in the ship's deck log, but uh, it was nowhere near as severe as other vessels. Some ships, particularly the light aircraft carriers, took severe damage and their aircraft, which are normally tied down on deck, were breaking free and then slamming into each other and starting fires. Uh, so ships like the Monterey took severe damage as if they'd been hit by a bomb. Other ships just took damage because the waves were washing aircraft off of the deck. Battleships don't have hangars for their aircraft, and American carriers notoriously operate more aircraft than they have hangar space for, thanks to deck parking. Uh, and other things like radars and radio antennas on the main deck get swept away, as do sailors. When we hit the storm on the 17th, I was on watch on the bridge, and General, well, General, yeah, Lieutenant, Gerald Ford was the duty officer that night, so I spent four hours beginning part of the storm on the bridge with Gerald Ford as duty officer that night. Which watch was that? That was at 12 to 4. And at 4, uh, we were starting to head into the storm, and the seas were starting to kick up enough so that when you went below and got in your bunk, you strapped yourself in. Uh, we never got to our bunk. Part way down, they decided to call general quarters. Now, uh, during the storm, everything we had on the flight deck went over the side. Because at one point, we took a 39 degree rule and uh, everything we had topside went over and that's when that included the planes right? that was the planes the tow motors uh bomb carriers uh luckily the planes on the flight back had been defueled and uh their ammo had been their armament had been uh put below uh that's when gerald ford almost lost it because we took that 39 degree roll he slipped and went across the flight deck, and the only thing that saved him was uh, the fl our flight deck was wood, railroad ties, and what they had was a metal edging, and below that is a catwalk. Well, the catwalks were only like 24 inches wide, but when we took that roll, he fell, slipped, and went across the flight deck. And the only thing that saved him was he grabbed that metal edging and was able to put his feet down on the catwalk. That's the only thing that kept him from going over to the side at the beginning of the storm. But what 
happened to make us go to general quarters, as I said, we lost everything topside. Seven planes went over the side, I believe, from the flight deck. Well, we had more than that on the flight deck. Uh, so you lost more than seven. Okay, the official uh, word. The, the, the official word I'm here to tell you, uh, from my uh, personal observation, the official word on the losses in the whole typhoon were only done for the benefit of Tokyo Rose so she could broadcast it. 150 planes, no, we lost much more than that. 700 and, I, I forget the change count, of personnel. 790 now, is the official. We, we, we lost more than that. Uh, the one thing I don't understand, I know I saw a light cruiser go down that day and there's no mention of it in any of the history books and I don't even know the name of it. But you we saw were, it go down. I watched it from my gun mount. Typhoon Cobra was only the first of the typhoons. Typhoon Connie, better known as Typhoon Viper, was a typhoon that the uh, Third Fleet again sailed through in 1945. This would have been in June, near the beginning of typhoon season. And this one, although there were only six casualties, again wrecked well over 100 aircraft and did significant damage to the cruisers and carriers in particular. The typhoon was so bad that we hatched down all the hatches on the ship and uh, no one was on, uh, allowed out on the main deck and the water was coming up over the bow of the front of the ship and uh, over the main deck and uh, it wasn't nobody allowed out on there and it was everything was just about secured on the ship and uh, we uh, was really looked almost like a submarine sometimes it was so bad uh, several of the carriers had their forward flight decks collapse there's some really interesting pictures of these uh, and you see immediately post-war all of these carriers have what's called hurricane enclosed bow built around the flight deck so they no longer go out over the front of the ship and overhang an open area. These hurricane enclosed bows uh, are quite common on the Essex class carriers that are still open as museum ships today. So if you want to see Intrepid in New York, Lexington in Corpus Christi, Yorktown in Charleston, South Carolina, or Hornet in Alameda, California, you can see these post-war hurricane enclosed bows. It wasn't just the bows of the carriers though. The uh, heavy cruisers, such as the Baltimore-class cruiser Pittsburgh, suffered damage. The armored belt stops just forward of turret number one at the forward bulkhead. Everything forward of that is uh, basically just for hydrodynamic efficiency bolted on, and it's significantly thinner. Uh, and because it's so narrow, it's got a completely different buoyancy than when you get to the wide part of the ship that's supporting the turrets and engines. So during this storm, Pittsburgh was thrown so severely with, uh, say, the front of the ship being on a wave, the back of the ship being on the wave, and a trowel being in the middle because she's well over 600 feet long, that uh, the, the different buoyancy issues and differences in thicknesses of metal caused the entire bow of the ship to break free. She earned the nickname as the longest ship in the Navy because Pittsburgh was towed back to Guam and her bow was still in the middle of the Central Pacific. Pittsburgh's bow was eventually recovered and she did have, uh, she, she was reconstructed and returned to service, but not until post-war. So some of the damage that these American ships took during the storms knocked them out of the war entirely. Uh, other ships were knocked out for months at a time. So we've talked about other vessels. Let's talk about Iowa-class battleships now. The Iowas uh, have a particularly high length to beam ratio, uh, which means they are very long and they're narrow for their width. A wider ship is going to have better sea keeping. It's going to roll less. But a narrower ship is going to be able to attain a higher speed. And these battleships were designed to go fast particularly to get the most hydrodynamic efficiency possible. We've already talked about how the bow 
narrows in a very, very uncommon hole form. Uh, and this means that there is very little buoyancy at the bow, and the bow is very lightly attached to the armored bulkhead. Uh, at high speed, this bow part of the ship was known to vibrate severely, uh, and we know that it flexed as well. Sailors have reported that they could feel it twisting as it was cutting through the waves. Uh, and we can doubly confirm that because a known class issue on these ships was cracking along one of the bulkheads that separated the uh, forward part of the ship from the more buoyant aft part of the ship. So those vibrations and that twisting uh, was translating into cracking that allowed fuel oil to leak out of some of those tanks uh, because of the, the size of the cracks. And those were repaired in the 80s, and we are aware of them and continue to inspect them today, uh, because today the bow of the ship is uh, unloaded. It would normally be full of stores. So the bow is about 10 feet higher in the water than it should be compared to the stern, which does have a ton of armored weight over top of it, which means that even though it doesn't have any stores, it's still sitting lower in the water. Another issue was the forward gun turrets. During Typhoon Cobra and other storms that the ship sailed through during her career, it was noted that green water was breaking over the bridge. Well, the bridge is 40 feet above us and probably 70 feet above sea level, and green water, as opposed to white water, the foam on top, means that it was going significantly higher than that. It was deep water over the bridge. So, obviously things like turret one, the lowest mounted of the ship's three turrets, are in the way of that. A number of you guys have asked about these black bags on the turrets. They're commonly called bloomers, and they're basically a rubberized canvas. On some ships you'll see them in white. Uh, on New Jersey they're almost always black. And the reason they're there is because there's a huge opening in the face of the turret that allows the barrel to elevate and depress. And that huge opening would let water right inside. That's obviously bad when you are working with gunpowder in there, which is rendered inert by water, and when you've got all sorts of sensitive electronics in there for operating these turrets that have to be heavily greased. So, the bloomers are installed. Uh, the bloomers like I said, they're just rubberized canvas. They're, they're pretty darn heavy and difficult to replace, but it's possible to do in a shipyard, and our volunteers were able to do it manually elevating and depressing the turrets when the ship was opened up as a museum. So it's not impossible. Our bloomers were stored in the officer's wardroom. Battleship Iowa's bloomers disappeared, uh, and so they replaced it with a rubber that a company was willing to donate. And uh, so if you look at her bloomers, they, they look pretty accurate, but they're a, a much lighter material that they were able to get over the barrels. Iowa also blew off her bloomers on at least one occasion in the 1980s. They were doing what's called a John Wayne shoot, which is one of those rare occasions where you fire both guns forward. And this would have been a test shoot. It, it's not something that you would normally do. But firing turret two over top of turret one uh, blew the bloomers off of turret number one. Battleship New Jersey sees a similar blast effect during the Korean War in 1951 when we took damage. It damaged the bloomers and they had to be replaced. So like I said, they're completely replaceable. Uh, what do we do today if they start to leak? Because obviously we don't want to replace these old things. Flex seal. You guys saw it. it turned a screen door in the bottom of a boat into a watertight seal. It's perfectly fine for rubber like uh, the bloomers and the expansion joint. First off, uh, you'll notice that we've got very un-battleship-like tables and chairs around here. Uh, this is one of several event spaces you can rent on board the ship for events. Uh, we do weddings, re-enlistment ceremonies, retirement ceremonies. Uh, we've been doing proms recently. Uh, somebody came on and asked about a comedy show recently. So th there's all sorts of things you can do on board. Uh, we, we've hosted sporting events on board. Uh, and we've got a number of different spaces based on the number of guests you have. You have a birthday party with 20 kids, we've got a space that'll fit you and a price point that'll, that'll work for that. If you want to bring 50 people or so up here under the awning on the bow is a good place. And then we've got the tents on the fantail if you've got high numbers of people like, like an entire high school prom. But the reason we've repositioned here is you can see the side of turret one behind me, this big gray wall, and you might see that there is a welded patch at the back of the side here. 
That's where originally there was an optical rangefinder sticking out. As built, all three of Battleship New Jersey's turrets have an optical rangefinder. In the 1950s, they removed the turret one rangefinders from all four Iowas. They did this for two reasons. One, uh, the turret one rangefinder was different from turret two and three. It had some night vision stuff in it as opposed to the regular optical rangefinders. And so by removing it from all four ships, you're removing another item from the Navy's inventory. The battleships already have three main battery fire control positions in the superstructure, four secondary battery fire control positions in the superstructure that can be cross-connected for the main battery, and each turret had its own rangefinder. So knocking out one rangefinder did not in any way reduce the combat capability of these ships. So being able to reduce the inventory in that way made sense. And you don't need night vision when you've got radar now. And each of the turrets does have its own radar mounted on top. The other reason, and the one that's actually relevant to the video we've been shooting today, is uh, the rangefinder has optical viewports built into it, and that would allow water in heavy seas to get into it and into the turret. This was only an issue with turret one, which is the lowest mounted of them. Turret two is two stories higher, basically, and so it's less of an issue. And turret three at the back of the ship isn't taking waves like turret one and two are. But even that is raised up a little bit higher than turret one because of the, uh, it's sitting above the propeller shafts and other propulsion equipment. So it made sense to remove that and just weld a, uh, a blank over it, essentially. Another issue uh, were the forward 40 millimeter gun positions and the forward 20 millimeter gun positions. On uh, the Iowa and New Jersey as built, there is just an open railing at the bow and they quickly have that plated in. And so all four Iowas now have uh, plating around the bow to help break up that water. The forward 40 millimeter positions were awash quite often. And so on Iowa, they're removed earlier than any of the other positions. This wasn't done on any of the other Iowas as far as I know, but uh, likely would have been had they served later into the 80s. The 20 millimeter positions on the bow had a really enclosed tub built around them, and they were still very wet positions, but they were probably the last 20 millimeters on board because they were retained in case the uh, North Koreans laid mines. You could see them and engage them with the guns from that position. Uh, but by 1951, late 1951, early 1952, all of the 20 millimeter guns had been removed. And uh, by the time the Iowas are brought back in the 1960s, all of the 40 millimeter guns are removed as well. I've seen some designs for bringing back the Iowas in the 80s that included uh, Sea Whiz or other missile launchers at the bow. And ultimately this was never done for two reasons. One is the blast effect from the main guns would shred the electronics in those, too much shock effect. And so you see the Sea Whiz actually mounted pretty far back and uh, high up in the superstructure. Other missile systems like the Sea Sparrow were not included at all because these guns would damage them. Even though, like I said earlier, there's plenty of deck space. So uh, talking about the battleship going through storms all the time, uh, we get asked pretty often, do sailors get seasick? Well, when you're up here on deck and you can see the horizon, it doesn't really happen that much. But during a storm, you're probably going to be inside the ship. And war-built ships like the Iowas, uh, particularly war-built ships that have multiple layers of steel, do not have portholes in most of the interior spaces. We've got none in the hall at all. I don't know whether you've ever been in a men's locker room. Mm -hmm. But it's very humid you know, and smelly. Mm -hmm. Now you take and mix that with seasickness. I walked into this compartment, and that's the smell that I got hit with. And I went around and found where my bunk was supposed to be, and there was a guy flat in his face, with his face in his vomit, on the thing. I'd be need a hasty retreat 
So the enlisted guys did not have uh, any way to see the horizon in most of their duty stations unless they're working on the bridge. Uh, and so we've got tons of stories of sailors getting seasick, even highly experienced chiefs. Uh, and it's pretty frequent when a ship goes out to sea the first couple of days, uh, sailors, especially green sailors, get sick on board. And then eventually you get used to the constant rocking and rolling of the ship. Modern ships have, uh, in many instances, thrusters on them so that they will only rock to a certain degree before they stop abruptly and the thrusters kick them back in the other direction. World War II ships do not have this, uh, so I've been told they have a much easier roll to them. You, you go the full course of the roll and come back. Uh, but it does mean for ships like those lost during Typhoon Cobra, if you reach a certain degree, more than 45 or 50 degrees, your weight is now too high up over the water and you cannot recover from that roll. You can only continue. So this video has covered a broad number of topics, uh, pretty shallowly. If you want to hear more about the typhoon that the ship went through, there's a link in the description to that previous video. If you would like to see future videos on how to design a ship for better sea keeping, things like that, uh, we, we briefly touched about a number of those topics in this video, but let us know in the comments section down below if that's something you'd like to see in a future video and we'll make it in the coming months. If you've been to sea before, did you ever get seasick? Let us know in the comment section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and also from a number of businesses and viewers like you. In particular, the support from viewers like you has allowed us to make way more videos than we were before. Uh, and so if you would like to support us, there's a link in the description below. And remember, if there's something you would specifically like to see and you'd like to make a donation, shoot us a message saying that you donated and, and what topic you'd like to see. Uh, again, it costs us about 50 bucks to make each of these videos. Another way to support us is by liking, sharing, and subscribing. That will show other people that we're making videos, and uh, it'll let you know when we're releasing new content five days a week. Thanks for watching.